All right, let's look at how to solve cyclohexane chair conformation problems. In these problems, you're being asked to draw two chair conformations for each molecule that's below, and then circle the more stable conformation. Um, so our first problem we're going to look at is cis-2-chloro, 1-methyl-cyclohexane. Now, if you can't envision what that looks like, it might be worth the time and the effort to do a quick sketch of this molecule. So start with a two-dimensional sketch. The cis portion of this, remember, this is indicating that both of the substituents that we're discussing in this case are going to be pointing in the same direction. Pick a carbon. It doesn't really matter which carbon we're talking about. We could call this one, you know, we could call this one carbon one. We could call this one carbon two. It really doesn't matter. But in any case, it tells us that we're going to put a chloro in the two position, and then we're going to put a one methyl I'm sorry, we're going to put a methyl group in the 1 position. Now, the fact that it's cis means that we have to use uh, wedges or hash marks to indicate the relative stereochemistry. So the way we'll do this is we'll just go ahead and use a wedge. All right, so now we have to draw our chair conformation. So let's do that. We'll start by sketching out a chair conformation, something like this. And then what I like to do is um, pick two carbons. Well, in this case, I like to pick a reference carbon. So we're going to make this red carbon, or this carbon red, and we're going to call this our reference carbon right there. And then we will make this our yellow carbon. We'll go ahead and put that one there just for our own sanity when we're working through these problems. All right, so look at the red carbon first in our first chair conformation. Uh, remember, we have two substituents. These carbon-carbon bonds are pointing in the up direction, right? So the, the way I remember this, or the way I used to remember this in college, was if they're pointing in the up direction, they're pointing to a carbon where the axial substituent will be pointing up. And then the equatorial substituent will be the will be 100 and roughly about 110 degrees away from that axial substituent. So we'll go ahead and do that. And we'll show you another kind of interesting little phenomenon here. You notice here the carbon-carbon bonds are sort of pointing down. So this is going to tell us that the axial substituents are also going to be pointing down in this at the yellow carbon. All right, so now we put our substituents in there. Um, look at the first one. The methyl group is in the up position. So if given the choice between the up carbon, the red carbon, and the down carbon, of course, we're going to put our methyl group here. Right, now we look at the carbon 2, and chlorine is going to be in the up position. So we're going to go ahead and put this CL like that. And then, of course, we'll have an H that sort of looks something like this. Let's do our ring flip. And to do that, we will draw this ring backwards. And we have to remember which carbons we're looking at. We'll go ahead and put our axial substituents in there. And then we have our equatorial substituents. And now we go ahead and fit everything in here. So ME, this is an H, CL, there's an H here. Okay, so a quick analysis of these two molecules. Well, we'll highlight them in green, how's that sound? Um, in the first molecule on the left-hand side, we see that the methyl group is in the axial position. And in the second molecule on the right-hand side, we see the chlorine is in the axial position. And so the question really becomes, which one of these is going to be the more stable conformation? In other words, which one of these is going to be harder or easier to put up into the air, I guess, so to speak, right? And the way we can determine this quantitatively is we have to pull a little bit of data to see it, but we'll drag some data on the frame here. And these are A values. And A values will tell you how much energy is required to put that substituent into the axial position. <clears throat> so we're comparing a methyl group, a CH3, which it's going to take 1.7 kcal per mole to put that into the axial position versus a chlorine, which is about 2.5 kilojoules per mole or 0.6 kcal per mole. So the point here is, is that it is easier to put a chlorine in the axial position than it is to put a methyl group in the axial position. And this makes sense because a single chlorine atom is pretty small um, and a methyl group is going to consist of a carbon and three hydrogens. So it's 
likely to have a, a slightly bigger electron cloud, which means it's going to be more susceptible to that um, those diaxial interactions that we've discussed in class. So if we had to guess on this one, which one was going to be the more stable, which is going to be the more stable uh, chair conformation, we'll do this in green for the money, we would expect this to be more stable because it is easier to put a chlorine in the axial position than to put a methyl in the axial position. All right, let's look at another problem. So in this problem, we're given that we have trans two amino one isopropyl cyclohexane. So again, let's start with our two dimensional structure. And again, I like to number these accordingly, right? So make the top carbon one, make the second carbon two, and now I've got all the information I need, right? So I'm gonna put an isopropyl group at carbon one, and then I'm going to put an amino group at carbon two. Now the trans portion of this means one sticking up and one sticking down, and it really doesn't matter which is which, as long as relatively one is sticking up and one is sticking down. So we'll go ahead and color that one in. We'll color the isopropyl group sort of sticking up bond here. We'll go ahead and put in some hash marks to show that the amino group is pointing down. And so now we have our bond line structure for this molecule. Let's turn him into a chair conformation. So we got to draw our chair conformations. These take a while to learn how to draw these correctly. So again, we'll color code everything like we did last problem. Let's see, carbon two, we'll color that in yellow. And then let's see, we have the amino, the NH2 is in the down position. So if given the choice between the two, we're gonna put our NH2 there, which means there's a hydrogen right there. And again, we'll go ahead and highlight all the substituents that are in the axial position. And we see that both the isopropyl and the amino groups are in the axial position, which is to say um, they are exhibiting or they are contributing to axial interactions, diaxial interactions with the hydrogens in the well, three carbons away. All right, so now we know that this is likely going to be unstable. So and we also should know that as we ring flip this, whatever becomes axial is now equatorial and vice versa. So let's go ahead and draw that. I had an amazing research advisor in graduate school. They used to make his students draw 100 chair confirmations in both directions. All right, and let's see here. So red carbon isopropyl was in the up position initially on the left-hand confirmation. So now it was in the axial position, I guess. And so now in the ring flip, it should be in the equatorial position, which happens to be up. And then the amino group was in the axial position for the yellow carbon, pointing down. And now when we ring flip, it should be in the equatorial position, pointing down. And then let's go ahead and put our hydrogens in there. And we can already see that by doing a ring flip, we are taking those substituents at carbons one and two, the isopropyl group and the amino group, and we are pushing them into the axial, no, the equatorial position to try to minimize those one, three diaxial interactions. And so as a result of that, this is going to be our more stable confirmation.